You're traveling through another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and of sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of the imagination. There's a signpost up ahead. Your next stop, the narrow mind. All right, and welcome once again to the narrow mind on this Thursday afternoon, 22nd of February, on this Covenant Theology Thursday. I have with me once again in studio my friends and brothers in the ministry, Pastors Jason Robertson, Pastor Scott Hill. Brothers, welcome to the Narrow Mind Studio. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. So what do you guys think about this time slot? You know, I, I can't uh, do it at 6 p.m. on Thursday night because I have a Bible study that takes place. I like it because I'm smarter at 3 p.m. than I am at 9 a.m. Oh, really? Yeah. So I'm looking at the Bible that you brought today. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I've never seen that before in the morning. No, this is the... Uh, Inspirational Study Bible by Max Lucado. All right. Um, Maybe we should study baptism. It is in the New King James Version, though. Okay. So. All right. So I'll stick with just reading the scriptures, and we won't read those notes over on the sides. That would that that would be very helpful. (laughs) All right. So I want to I want to make a special announcement. Tomorrow night we have the show scheduled at 6 p.m. It's Open Phones Friday, but I'm going to have something special going on at 9 a.m. in the morning. Paul Minot is going to be in the studio. We're going to pre-record Atheist Wednesday for next week. So I'm not going to put this up on the website. The only people that are going to know about it are the people that are listening live right now and the people that download the, and listen to the podcast within the next uh, 15 or so hours, however many hours it is until 9 o'clock in the morning. But we're going to be talking about the Rational Response Squad. You know, they've been getting a lot of attention because of their... their uh, blasphemy challenge that they put up on youtube and uh, we got some interesting little factoids that we're going to be talking about with paul Manata. those of you uh, may remember paul Manata from his debate with dan barker where he basically uh, uh really confirmed dan barker's philosophy that dan barker is no more valuable than broccoli so <laughs> that was in dan barker's book by the way so tune in tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. We're not going to advertise it. We're not going to announce it again. We're just going to play the stream at 9 o'clock. So you'll be able to hear the, the recording. It's actually going to be pre-recorded for next Wednesday, for next Atheistic Wednesday. should be interesting. All right, and you may have caught on Monday night, gaychristian101.com. Uh, we had a guy by the name of Rick on the show. He was talking about his uh, his new book that's coming out. And so if you haven't got a chance to listen to that, you might want to listen to that. And uh, you, you, Brother Jason, you actually uh, put a post up over there on Fido. Yes, yes. We posted it, began to talk about it. A lot of people were commenting. It's a really good debate in the comments section. It, it, it really is. It, it didn't just get, I mean, what it could have been. There were Most of, most of it was at least attempts to try to show uh, Richard where his exegesis mm-hmm. was wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. and so it's, so it's worth biblical, reading. It really is. Very biblically centered. Now we've got some uh, some new listeners as a result of that uh, of that conversation that took place on Monday night. Oh. So I just uh, you know in the Christian spirit, I would just like to uh, welcome our new listeners that may have become listeners as a result of the show on Monday, and just give them. Uh, good thoughts is kind of the, um, I, I guess it would be the exact opposite of Fido. It's when Fido takes off his spike collar yes. and puts yes. on a pink bow. Pink bow <laughs> and a tutu. Okay. Well, I've got a theme song for that one also. How about this?
thoughts. <laughs> Good thought. The um, the uh, web address is www. You don't have to say that anymore. Wambulance.blogspot.com. <laughs> Wambulance. That's with eight A's. W, eight A's, Bulance, Wambulance. <laughs> yeah. After the uh, 80s band Wham or what? No, just where when somebody's whining and griping, you tell them to go call the Wambulance. Okay. So. All right, well, let's try to get refocused. Let's try to talk about uh, what we're here to talk about today, covenant theology. We've got actually a very serious, very serious topic in front of us today. We've been talking about the different aspects of redemption. We've kind of been doing an overview of John Murray's book. We've talked about propitiation. We've talked about atonement. We've talked about expiation. We've talked about, what else have we talked about? Reconciliation. Reconciliation, uh, sacrifice. We've talked about. All kinds of stuff that has to do with the atonement. Now, this morning, or I keep thinking it's morning time, this afternoon we're going to be talking about the word redemption. What does the word redemption mean? What does the concept of redemption mean? Murray writes on page 42 of his book, Redemption Accomplished and Applied, The language of redemption is the language of purchase and more specifically of ransom. And ransom is the securing of a release by the payment of a price. All right, well, that seems... Fairly straightforward. Let's let's take a look at a couple of verses. Let's look first at uh, Matthew uh, chapter 20, verse 28. You want to read that for us, Scott? Sure. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Okay, so when we talk about uh, Christ giving his life as a ransom, we can look at uh, that concept from three different angles. First of all, we can easily see from this text that the work that he came into the world accomplished is a work of ransom. Yes. Secondly, we can see that the giving of his life was the ransom price. And thirdly, we see that the ransom is substitutionary by its very nature. Absolutely. So ransom presupposes the idea of <clears throat> bondage or captivity, does it not? Well, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you think about, you know, a ransom note? Every kidnapping movie in the world, they always ask for a ransom. And, you know, I, as far as I can think of, that's the only time you ever even hear that term is in, you know, a situation like that. And uh, Does the Bible speak of uh, human beings as being kidnapped? Do you ever think about that? I, I haven't ever thought about that. It does speak about us being in bondage. Bondage. Yeah. To, uh, I'm thinking Absolutely. of uh, 2 Timothy 2, 24 yes. through 26, we're in bondage to do the work of, mm-hmm. or the, the will of the devil. I never mm-hmm. really put the, those two together, but I can definitely see the, the middle It was kind of like there. a voluntary kidnap. You right, know? Yeah, yeah. Like that guy that decides to go on a joyride and, okay, I'm ready to go back now. You ain't yeah, going back. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's sad, but, but that's kind of a, a fair analogy, I think. Murray also writes on page 43, just as sacrifice is directed to the need created by our guilt, propitiation to the need that arises from the wrath of God, reconciliation to the need arising from our alienation from God. So redemption is directed to the bondage to which our sin has consigned us. So we've got a problem, and that is that uh, as a result of Adam, we have been sold into bondage. We're pretty much, uh, the language actually resembles um, slave trading analogies. Uh-huh. Paul uses that language of himself, sold into sin, yeah. and we were sold by our first father, Adam. How, the power of uh, of what Murray has said here on page 43 is the fact that he summarized that the issue of what Christ did on the cross is complex. Yes. And uh, that's that's what he's driving home, and the fact that First of all, our sinfulness was complex. We were guilty. The wrath of God was directed towards us. We were alienated from God and in bondage to our sin. So the sacrifice or the death of Christ on the cross was equally complex in the fact that it was a sacrifice, a propitiation, a reconciliation, and a redemption mm. so that it, so that it, uh, it saved us from all of our problems. That's right. Uh, when we talk about 
being redeemed. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the case of a, a kidnap, you're being redeemed from the kidnapper. In the case of the slave market, if uh, somebody redeems you, they take you out of the slave market. Yeah. Uh, what is it that the Christian is redeemed from? I mean, there are several things that we're redeemed from, but what are some of the things that, that come to mind as a result of your own study of this issue? Well, according to Murray, we're redeemed from two, uh, two things, basically, and that would be uh, our relationship to the law and our relationship to sin. That we have, uh, we are, we have a problem with the law and we have a problem with sin. Okay. That's on a basic level. All right. So when we talk about being redeemed from the law, well, the Bible doesn't say, we, we might tend to think, and, and this is probably part of the problem with a, a dispensational understanding. Because uh -huh. Murray is, is quick to point out on page 43 that when the Bible says that we are redeemed it doesn't say that we are redeemed from the law. From the law, yeah. In the sense that right. we now have no relationship to the law. Uh -huh. uh, now there were there were people at certain times that did believe that we were redeemed from the law. There were the antinomians that uh, were around during like the days of the Westminster Assembly mm -hmm. um, that uh, the the Westminster divines wrote strongly against, who believed that uh, when we are redeemed or saved or born again. That we are in a, in essence no longer sinners, mm. you see, because our our in from an antinomian viewpoint, the law of, of the the law of the word of God is no longer applicable to our lives. We're no longer under an obligation uh, to live according to it. And then, of course, there's different versions of that. And uh, but very few people today believe that Christians are not sinners simultaneously as being saved and sinners. And then there's some that believe that you can progressively become a perfectionist or mm -hmm. you can stop you can stop sinning over time. And so those are Dan two. Dan Corner, for example. Dan Corner. Mm -hmm. Remember him? I don't remember him. Refresh my memory. <laughs> you don't want to remember him. <laughs> well you know Finney Finney was Yeah Finney he was, was like he was that, uh, progressive. Yeah, yeah he believed Finney, perfectionism. Wesley. Yeah. But Dan Corner was a guy that I interviewed back in December, right after Christmas. He was the oh, guy okay. that um, he was the guy that was saying that he had he had crucified the the sin of lust. Oh, I remember I now that, that. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so he hadn't uh, committed the sin of lust for some seven yeah. months, three weeks, and four days That's and three good. hours. Yeah, all right. It was yeah. He he was he was serious. Hmm. I mean, he didn't give me that exact timeline. Of course, I'm saying that tongue in cheek, but the. He was basically saying that the expectation on the Christian uh -huh. is to get to the place where we no longer sin. Uh -huh. Certainly that's the goal of being a Christian. Yeah. Certainly uh, there's a part of truth in that. Right. We are. Yeah. And that, that brings us back to the original point. Uh, we're not redeemed from the law in the sense that we, know, we, we no longer have an obligation to keep the law. Now, we, we heard this exactly. come out on Monday night, too, mm -hmm. when the, uh, the homosexual advocate said, well, Gene, w the Bible says that we're not under law, we're under grace. Yeah. So what does that mean? Does that mean that we are n no longer any, uh, under any obligation to love God and love our neighbor? Because Jesus says the whole law hangs on those two commandments. Right. And the answer is no. Now, this becomes very confusing in dispensationalism because of the sharp dichotomy that's made between Old Covenant and New Covenant. Right. You see, the Old is law, the New right. is grace. And so there's a lot of confusion in the minds of a lot of dispensationalists. I know that there was confusion in my mind um, as a dispensationalist. My mind, too, in this exact same area that you're bringing up here. Right, because I wasn't sure. It right. seemed that we were no longer under the law, but now... Uh -huh. Um, I knew that I couldn't go out and commit adultery without right. God being. And then you've got, and then you've got as of late these new covenant theologians that believe that the law has been rewritten in the New Testament, right? In in such a manner <laughs> that uh, it 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 is totally different from mm -hmm. the Old Testament law. So right. I think all of these are missing the point, missing the target. Yeah. Missing the truth. Some of them are closer to the truth than others. That's the definition for sin. Missed the mark. <laughs> <laughs> They're missing the mark. And by the way, wrong theology is nothing short is of dangerous. sinful. That's right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So the question would be then, what is Murray talking about? Okay. First of all, the Bible very clearly teaches that we are, and I explained this on Monday night, 
we are no longer under the curse of the law or the condemnation of the law. One place, for example, we might read about that would be in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13, where we read, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become, an, having became, or having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. And so one of the things that Christ redeems us from is the curse of the law or the condemnation of the law. That's what Paul means when he says, we are not under law, we are under grace. He, he means that we have now moved out from the condemnation that is brought about by our disobedience to the law, the condemnation that is brought about by our first father, Adam, and now we've moved into a standing with God that is under the umbrella of grace. It's an undeserved yes. standing where the condemnation of the law is no longer hovering over our heads. There is now no condemnation. That's right. For those Good verse. Who are in Christ Jesus. Now, in verse 10 of the same chapter, Galatians 3, Paul says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now, so you're saying there are some people who are still under the curse. Absolutely. So that means that when Christ died on the cross, he redeemed us or ransomed us from the curse, but the but that doesn't mean necessarily that the curse itself went away. That's right. In other words, um, because there are some people that believe that when he died on the cross, the curse was done away with universally. Right. Because they see the work of redemption as being universal in its scope and its extent. Right. Once you make that error, once you make the mistake of, of saying the atonement is universal, mm -hmm. Now you've opened Pandora's box because now what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to say that all of that curse that the old covenant law brought has been dealt with. Mm -hmm. This is why you hear sometimes from pulpits or on your on your radio dial, the preacher saying, Jesus went and he dealt with all the problem with sin. Now, the only issue between you and him is what will you do with his son? Yeah. Right. And so there's this mindset that. The whole law and the condemnation that the law brought has been dealt with because of verses like this, because there's a failure to understand right. the specific nature and extent of the atonement. Right. In fact, I've heard uh, preachers say that the that God, that Christ paid for every sin on the cross and the curse of every sin, except for one, and that would be unrepentance. And, and so if you don't repent, then you don't <laughs> get saved because that sin was not dealt with. So that is a that's a stretch. They're trying to come up with some way to prove some scenario in which Christ dealt with all sin and yet leave open that there's still a hell and you can go there. It's a co-op. Yeah. Christ pays for most of my sins, mm -hmm. but not all of them. So that's It's bad theology, man. So Christ bad went theology. to the cross. You, you, it, that's now, limited atonement. Yeah, right? exactly. Now you're yeah. saying Christ went to yeah. the cross and paid for many sins. Instead of many people. Instead of the very first verse you read out of Matthew where it mm. says he went and paid a ransom for many right. people. Mm. Right. Yeah. So it, did he pay for many people completely or did he just pay for many sins for all people? There's your two options. Those are the two options. Yeah. All right, let me give out the phone number. Our phone number is 1-800-466-1873. That is toll-free, 800-466-1873. Or you can call us at 951-676-0583. <coughs> we will uh, entertain your questions or comments concerning this particular subject. If you have a question, maybe you're hearing this for the first time, and this is totally foreign to you. Uh, this is nothing new. I'll remind you, this has been around since the beginning of church history. It may be something new to you because you're existing and living in uh, 21st century modern evangelicalism that has such a low, uh, a low premium on the study of theology and the preaching of theology that these issues that are very important, they get pushed off to the back burner. In fact, a lot of times they're never dealt with at all. So it's important for us to get this straight from the beginning. What does it mean to be redeemed from the law? From the law. It means from the curse of the law. From the curse of the law. Also, he says, from the ceremonial law. 
Okay, so we are redeemed from the curse of the moral law, and we are redeemed from the ceremonial law. Let's take a look at a couple of passages here. Let's turn over to Galatians 4, since we're still in the book of Galatians. In chapter 4, uh, let's look at, uh, well, let's just start reading in verse 1. Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those who were born under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth his spirit, the spirit of his son, into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Okay. So here he talks about, in verse 3, the bondage under the elemental things. Now, another translation would be the rudimentary teachings or principles. Which uh, Now, I'm, I'm looking at the uh, New American Standard. So what does it say in the King James? It calls it the elementary principles of the world. Okay. And in the New King James, is it the same? It just says under, we're under the elements of the world. Okay. This is speaking of, I believe this is speaking of, and you can check this out in different commentators. This is actually speaking of the relationship of the worshiper to the uh, ceremonial aspects of the law. Hmm. Because, notice, he talks about being a child, and then he talks about the fullness of, uh, of time. In verse 4, God sent forth his Son. When you go on reading in verse 9, now, now this is why I think that this is a ceremonial aspect. In verse 9, But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things which you desire to be to which you desire to be enslaved of enslaved all over again now what while well, he goes on to give the context i mean we know that the problem here is circumcision but he goes on right. to say in verse 10 you observe days months and seasons and years so he's he's driving home this reality that uh, they've been redeemed from the old administration and its ceremonial aspects of the law. That would make sense because uh, in the beginning, he the analogy spoke of guardians and managers over the child. Right. And um, I'm trying to remember the address of the verse that says that uh, um, that the word of God was a schoolmaster, a tutor, a tutor. And, I'm uh, thinking of the same thing, and I, I can't uh, remember. It's in Galatians. Uh, maybe I was it's thinking it was in Galatians. I didn't have it marked here in this Bible I brought. But uh, the same identical uh, analogy is used, is that the Bible was a guardian. In fact, some, most commentators would say of that word uh, that the Scripture is a schoolmaster, that a better word is guardian, and uh, keeping you in that, in that atmosphere of legalism right. until you come to maturity. Yeah, I want to look at that verse because that's one of the main verses that is used as a dispensational proof text that now the Christian is not to be in any sense related to the law, hmm. but uh, he's to be led by the Spirit. And it's very clear. And, I, and I've been arguing for a long time. I mean, a long time. I taught the Galatians back in 2001, and I taught it back then that this was in reference to the ceremonial aspects of the law, and people were looking at me crazy. We're looking at Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. Galatians 3, verse 24 says, Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. In fact, in the English Standard Version, the word is guardian. They use the mm. term guardian. Now, I think, well, there's a footnote here in the New American Standard um, for verse 24 tutor or child conductor mm -hmm. okay so that gives us kind of a, a, a broader picture now mm -hmm. of what that word actually means so if you think in terms of a Sunday school teacher with a, a green felt board 
right back in the south. I'm sure you guys saw this before when you were kids growing up in the church. See, I didn't have this privilege. I'm just I just heard about it secondhand. So maybe you can confirm this. I was a heathen. I was one of the kids outside riding a skateboard by when you were saying, man, I should like to be riding my skateboard right now. But the Sunday school teacher takes that felt board and she says, okay, here's the temple. Here's the lamb. Here's the priest. Here's the uh, the covenant, uh, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant. She, she puts up all these pictures. And these are... Uh, th- this is a tutor or a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. Right. Yeah. When John the Baptist sees Jesus, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Mm-hmm. He's using that that uh, guardian language or that tutorial language mm-hmm. to point us to Christ. And it's important for us to understand that because so often this people say, but, but it says in verse 25, But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Right. What was the tutor? The tutor was the law in verse 24. But the reality is verse 23, before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which later was to be revealed. I think the easiest way to to, uh, rebut that argument is uh, a little bit of common sense. And that is whenever you graduate from school, Mm -hmm. from elementary school, for example, you're no longer under that elementary teacher. But two plus two still equals four. Right. <clears throat> so you're no longer under the teacher, under the guardian. Mm-hmm. But the that which she taught you are, is still true, and it's still applicable to your life. In fact, it's still absolute to your life. Right. If you graduate elementary and say, well, I'm no longer under Miss Johnson who taught me two plus two equals four, that sound, now I can say two plus two equals five. Well, you're wrong. That's right. You're wrong. And so the issue is not about is the law still applicable in the new covenant. The issue is, is what is our relationship to the law? Right. That's what changes. That's what changes. Because God's law, moral law, doesn't change. That's right. God's ceremonial law is a shadow, Mm -hmm. but notice it's a shadow that is modeled after the heavenly reality. Right. So we often look, and I think this is one of the mistakes that New Covenant theology makes, we often look at the Old Covenant types and shadows, or these ceremonial aspects, as the model. Yeah. But Hebrews tells us that that's a model made after the heavenly right. reality. Exactly. Yes. The temple that Moses built was a copy of the temple that's in heaven. Mm-hmm. So the, the expiration of the model, the ceremonial aspects now, comes as the heavenly temple, Jesus Christ, leaves heaven, comes down to earth, and the fulfillment of all those types and shadows now becomes a perpetual fulfillment in mm-hmm. that Christ is the very substance that those things pointed to. That's right. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Let me get our phone number once again, 1-800-466-1873. If you've got a question, a comment, a disagreement, whatever it is, we'd love to talk to you. If not, we're just happy that you're here with your Bible open, and hopefully we can learn together. Just listen to your heart. That's what I do. G'day, Pastor Cook. This is Andrew calling from Melbourne, Australia, and we listen to the Narrow Mind Down Under. I'm very bold. I know that. We're glad that you've joined us today. We're talking about some very serious issues. We're talking about redemption. We've talked about what it is that Christ redeemed us from. We've talked about the definition of the word redemption, what it means that... uh, we're actually bought out of something. And we're going to be talking more about this during our second half of the program. Uh, all right, so we've established that we are redeemed from the curse or the condemnation of the law, according to Galatians 3. We are redeemed in our relationship to the ceremonial law. We're no longer under the tutelary bondage of the Mosaic economy, as Murray says on page 44 which happens to be actually a quote from John Calvin. Uh, But we're also redeemed from the law of works. Mm -hmm. Why don't... Jason, why don't you explain to us what's meant by that, the law of works? Well, here's what Murray says. Christ has redeemed us from the necessity of keeping the law as the condition of our justification and acceptance with God. Of course, this goes all the way back to uh, the book of Genesis, 
pre-fall of Adam, that Adam's acceptance before God was conditioned by his obedience. Of course, he failed in that obedience, and uh, Christ has now become our substitute and has kept the law. His active and passive obedience is now the condition of our justification. Okay, so before Christ came, are you saying then that those that were under the law were saved by works? Uh, in, in a manner, you can say that, that, that the, the law of God is still works or it would not be law. The, the problem is, is that no man can keep the law. That's why it was a schoolmaster. That's why it was a teacher. It was pointing us to the necessity of the Messiah. And so in a, in, uh, so the law is still a law of works. But even in those days prior to Christ, as in Abraham's case, you're still, you still had to be justified by faith in the coming Messiah because no man could keep the law by himself. And what I'm saying is, is that, uh, there's a law of, there's the covenant of works prior to the fall. Then there's what we call the covenant of grace after the fall of Adam. But yet those two, um, though there's a distinction between the two, they're still, they're still the same in many ways. There's an overlap. There's an overlap. And what brings them together? It is the fact that there's a second Adam. There is a Christ who fulfills the works for us on our behalf. So what I'm saying is, is in the end, you can say, you know what? I'm saved by works. I'm saved by works. The same works that were required upon Adam that he failed to do were required upon me. And I'm saved by works. Here's the difference. I'm not saved by my works. I'm saved by the works of my substitute. Jesus Christ, okay, the I'm one glad, mediator. I'm glad you God made that man. clarification because I think we just lost about a half dozen listeners. <laughs> <laughs> well, so that we, is that is the great. Uh, that's I think that's the glory of covenant theology. Now, when somebody says, "Okay, so are you saying then that men under the old covenant were saved by works and that we're saved by grace now?" Because that's often the confusion that comes in. Uh, that's not, true. not at all. That's not what I'm saying at all. In fact, I think this is the great crisis that you see James writing about when he, whenever he says, you say you have faith, show me your faith. Because faith is, is works mm -hmm. in, in the fact that faith does look like something and act like something. What does it look like? It looks like a fulfillment of the law. And in the Old Testament, you cannot deny the fact that Abraham or Moses, let's take Moses, for example, and the children of Israel were required to keep the law. If you keep it, you're my children. If you do not keep it, you're cursed. That's a calling unto works. And yet here's the catch so that it's not a works salvation. The catch is, is that it's going to be impossible for you. And so you need to go down here to the temple and you need to sacrifice these lambs. And you need to put your faith in the Messiah who these lambs typify. You need to look to the Messiah who actually is going to be your justification. You're still called to fulfill the works, the law. The law is still over you. You will be judged according to the law, whether you kept it or not. But... The only way you're actually going to come out of this as being saved is the fact that you have to put your faith in the Lamb of God, okay. Jesus Christ. You said two things that I want to get some clarification on because I, I could see how these would... Uh, well, I just want to know what you mean. You said faith is works. Faith is... <laughs> you said that. I said that in, in, within you said a more. paragraph. Right. Yes. But nevertheless, you said it. Faith in what? That's my question. Yes. Faith in the works of Jesus Christ. Okay, so... Your faith is in the works of Jesus Christ. Right. Okay, that, well, that's an important distinction to make. I, yes. I think you were talking about faith manifesting itself in good works. And that's in true. In the context of what you said. That's true. So when you said faith is works, I think what you mean is those that have saving faith demonstrate yes. their saving faith by their works. I said that in the context of James. And remember, I said James was bringing up, and that that's so confusing right. about the book of James for for um, guys like Luther, mm -hmm. who was dealing with this issue of justification. 
-hmm. Because what I'm trying to say is if you say you have faith in Christ Mm -hmm. and yet your life is not fulfilling the law, the works of the law, Mm -hmm. then your faith in Christ is unbiblical. It's it's void and null of, of, of true faith because faith, when we say we have faith in Christ, what do we mean? What's the rest of that sentence? Our faith is in his passive and active obedience, in the finished work, right. work of Christ. And what we're saying is, is my faith is that Jesus Christ is my substitute and he fulfilled the covenant of works on my behalf for me Mm -hmm. and it's thereby that i am found acceptable in the eyes of god okay so when you say if you're if you have faith Mm -hmm. and you're not keeping the commandments of god you're using that in a general sense yes in other words our goal is to keep the commandments of god you're not saying obeying the law perfectly no but but that's our goal but yeah and and uh, and I don't make no bones about it because John himself in First John said, "Now look, uh, I write these things to you that you may not sin. Right. But when you sin, you have an advocate, and so he he doesn't uh, uh, falter from his exhortation of don't sin, of obedience, right? of obedience, fulfill the law, live according to the laws of God. That is your goal. And guess what? That's Feel the commandment upon your life. Be ye holy as I am holy. Right. Now, how does it happen? He says you're still going to sin, but know this. You have a mediator. You have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. And so you cannot disconnect the two. I must fulfill the law of God, but I can only do it through and in Jesus Christ. Okay, and you also said you are going to be judged according to the law. Yes. What do you mean by that? Because that that's a controversial statement. For a Christian, now we do believe that non-Christians, yes. unbelievers are going to be judged according to the law. Mm-hmm. But how exactly do you apply this to the believer? Well, I apply it in the fact that, listen, we've all been judged or are going to be judged. There's a judgment... Uh, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after death the judgment, we say, right? There's a judgment upon us all. The good news is, is my judgment, had, the judgment upon me, has been taken care of on the cross. Okay, good. I'm glad you made that clarification. Yes. I didn't know if you meant that, okay, you've got justification, and now, because this is kind of what it sounded like to somebody who may not know you mm-hmm. as well as I do, uh, that you've got justification, you've got faith in Christ, but you're still going to be judged by the law, by in the a law. sense. Yeah, and what you meant was that everybody's judged by the law. Mm-hmm. Uh, those that are unbelievers will be judged in the future when the judgment day happens. Those yes. of us that are Christians have been judged already as a result of us dying with Christ. Yes. In fact, I'll give you a, uh, I'll give you a scripture to back up what I'm saying for those who may be scratching their head and, and figuring this out. Romans chapter 2. Mm-hmm. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on the, uh, excuse me, the judgment of God rightly falls on those who do such things. Um, well, that's not exactly it. Where, where did it go? I was thinking of Colossians 2 where it talks about um, all the transgressions being nailed to the cross, being taken out of the way. Oh, here it is. He, he didn't hear what I said. <laughs> He's Brother, reading. I'm in the book. That's okay. All right, Romans 2.12. 2.12, not 2.2. 2.12. For all have sinned. Mm-hmm. That would include us. That mm-hmm. would include the redeemed and the unredeemed. It says, For all have sinned without the law will per- will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. I think what Paul is saying is, look, the law of God given to Moses, mm-hmm. it is applicable. It will it will be held over even those who were not in Israel in those days, even over the pagans and the heathens. They weren't under it but they'll still be judged by it, according to Paul. There's only one law of God. God has one set of rights and wrongs. I agree with that. Whether you know about them or not, 
mm-hmm. is not going to make a difference. You're either going to be judged under the law or you're going to be judged by the law, but it's still only one law. Right. I would agree with that. And I think what Murray's saying, to bring it back to the book, is he is saying we have been redeemed from the obligation of our justification being conditioned by human, by our our works as a cursed man. How? Because the God-man fulfilled the law for us. Amen. Now, in Romans chapter 5, verse 19, we read, Romans 5, 19, For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even though, or even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. So this, once again, has to do with a substitutionary, yes. uh, the federal headship. you get the federal headship of Adam, federal headship of Christ. Now, it talks about the many being made righteous. It's talking, now there it's talking about the active obedience of Christ. Mm-hmm. That he, uh, he gives us his, his life of perfect obedience in the transfer of imputed righteousness. Imputed. Justification. Yes. Mm-hmm. Now, what else does Christ redeem us from? According to Murray. Uh, he redeems us from sin. Sin. But, gen- I mean, specifically, what, what does he mean by that? Well, he gives us two categories under this. Mm-hmm. He says that it redeems us from the guilt of sin and from the power of sin. That's what the bait on the bottom of page 46. Okay. The guilt of sin and the power of sin. What, what is meant by the guilt of sin? He says here... Um, Feeling bad for it. Feeling really, really bad that you did it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to. I'm feeling guilty today. No, what does he mean by the guilt of sin? The guilt that accompanies that would be that would be connected with the curse. Um, and I'm uh, looking for something he said here, but just off the top of my head, he he talks about how this would be connected. Um, let me look at the top of page 47. In connection with redemption from the guilt of sin, the blood of Christ is substitutionary ransom, and the ransom price of our release is brought distinctively into view. That's not quite the quote I'm looking for, but our... I've our, got a verse here. Okay, go ahead. Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Hmm. Okay, so when I read this verse, I thought, okay, first of all, it uses the word redeem. But he redeems us from every lawless deed. That's talking about the guilt of disobedience that comes from disobeying God's law. And also, the guilt that's accompanied by being a son of Adam. So he redeems us from that, and he purifies us to be a people for his own possession. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on to say one more thing. Zealous. For good deeds, in other words, zealous for obedience. Hmm. So there's a shift in the even the attitude of the worshiper now, as he becomes a Christian. The guilt that he was, well, the condemnation of the law, the curse of the law that he was once under, has now been taken away. Right. But now he's been also empowered by the Holy Spirit, so that he has become zealous to obey God, zealous for good deeds, Titus. That's Titus chapter two verse fourteen, by the way. I think guilt there would uh, would point to um, what actually takes place at justification, and us being justified before God. Not no longer we're not, no longer carrying the 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 guilt or, or the um, guilt. I mean the condemnation. I, I, the condemnation. I, I, I right. You know. Yeah. I think uh, the word guilt sin. is used. Yeah. There's... It's just simul- simultaneously there with the with the uh, the guilt and thinking about about justification and its and its whole aspect of um it's really the effects right the effects of our sin is our guiltiness right and so it removes it redeems us from those consequences from those effects so it's not talking about the emotion of feeling guilty no well no but but you would say that it would have an effect on that sure if i were once guilty and now i'm not there is a there is a release, like you say. There is a, now a different attitude. Right. There is a a weight, a burden that has been lifted from me. 
and that it would be the guilt of sin and no longer has me in bondage, which is the ransom term is all about bondage. Right. Well, let's talk some more about that term ransom because usually when we think of ransom in the modern sense, we're talking about a uh, a payment being made, mm-hmm. uh, a, a, a financial payment. What is it? What, and the Bible, no doubt, uses that type of language. Mm-hmm. For example, Murray says on page 47, Although the terminology is not precisely that of redemption, we cannot mistake the redemptive import of Paul's statement in his charge to the elders of Ephesus when he refers to the church of God, which he hath purchased through his own blood, Acts 20.28. Mm-hmm. And so, under the heading of redemption, you have ransom, where God the Son gives himself in order that he might ransom us from our iniquity and purchase us. I mean, that's what we just read here in uh, verse 14 of Titus 2, who gave himself that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify himself, and own, uh, a people for his own possession. So we now become his own possession. Purchased with his blood. Right, yes. Let's take a look at a couple more passages, Ephesians 1.7 and Colossians 1.14. Ephesians 1.7. You're listening to The Narrow Mind on this Covenant Theology Thursday. If you've got a question or a comment, we would be willing to take your call today at 1-800-466-1873. We've only got about eight minutes left in the program, so if you're going to call, uh, you need to uh, get on it, 800-466-1873. All right, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 14. Well, let me read verse 13 and 14. For he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, forgiveness of sins. Huh. So that uh, that word redemption there is a is a like a buying us out of. It can be used synonymously with ransom. Uh-huh. He ransoms us, he redeems us from bondage from the domain of darkness and then he transfers us to the kingdom of his beloved son yes and what does ephesians say ephesians 1 7 says in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace right so so almost identical the same language right Uh, redemption is connected to forgiveness of sins now when we talk about the judgment taking place that we, we just mentioned it a moment ago. We're talking about this rede- being redeemed from guilt, being redeemed from the power of sin. We're talking about being redeemed from out under the weight of the law. Paul talks about this in Colossians chapter 2. And he says, uh, he talks about us being in union with Christ. So you mentioned, Jason, that everyone's judged according to the standards of the law. Mm-hmm. That judgment is either past in Christ mm-hmm. or future by Christ. Right. Okay, this is really interesting language here in Colossians chapter 2 in light of that. He says in uh, verse 11, And in him you were circumcised, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So we have a circumcision not of the body but of the heart. It's made without hands. Verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Okay, so notice it talks about us being buried with him in baptism. And then he says in verse 13, and you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh. He made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our transgressions having canceled out the debt or the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us and which was hostile to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Okay, so notice once again, there's this relationship to Christ. We were buried with him in baptism. We were raised up with him in faith. So there's the association of the substitutionary atonement. Right. Our salvation, our our judgment, if you will, that uh, took place according to the law 
took place by Christ as he hung there for us. Right. Now, this is really interesting language because it said, it talks in very specific, in a very specific past tense manner. Let me read it to you again. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When did the cross, when did this happen? Hmm. On Calvary's cross? Or when you walked the aisle and repeated the prayer? Happened at Calvary. It happened at Calvary. But yet Paul is saying that it happened in Calvary before I was ever born. Before I ever knew about it, Christ was there taking the decrees that stood against me, Uh the certificate of my debt. He removed it, even though I had no idea, Uh even though I was unaware of it, even though I could care less. That's the work that was accomplished on Calvary's cross. Now, that's important because if you don't understand what's going on here with this subject or with this term redemption this biblical term this category if you will Uh redemption you're going to be led to false conclusions like you talked about how you've heard that christ has taken all the law out of the way for us yeah why because now this is reinterpreted to mean every individual not just the elect if he's taken it out of the way then at least be consistent and become a universalist and say that everybody's going to heaven He's either taking it out of the way or he hasn't taken it out of the way. Right. If he's taking it out of the way, he's taking it all out of the way. Mm. He hasn't just taken some of it out of the way. In fact, the whole mindset, to, ha- to have that mindset about the law, you have mm. to believe the law is a negative thing anyway. Right. Hey, friend, it's a good thing that God has given us his law, that he's revealed his morality to us. In fact, I think you could, when as you read Murray, and he says we've been redeemed uh, from the guilt of sin, and then he says we've been redeemed from the power of sin. Mm-hmm. I think he quotes the same Colossians verse you're quoting, because when you when you understand what he did, is he re, we all are under the bondage of sin right. as sinners, which means sin has power over us. Uh, we don't have the ability. To be righteous. We don't have the ability to please God, to obey the law, even if we knew the law, like Israel knew the law. They didn't have the ability because of sin. And so when Christ redeems us, he redeems us from that bondage and that power of sin. Mm -hmm. And here's the great, the great news. He puts us under a new bondage, a new power. And that power is the power of Christ. In fact, it is the power of the law. You you come into a relationship with the law of God that you've never had before. The law was my enemy before I got saved. The law made me guilty. But you know what? I now have such a new relationship with the law now that I've been saved. I have a new attitude about it. It's no longer my enemy. It's my friend. And it has power in my life that as I live according to the law of God, the blessings of God flow from my life. And I'm able to accomplish the will of God and exalt God and glorify God in all things. And so the law is not dead to me. In salvation, the law became alive in me through the power of Christ. So you can say then with David now, you don't have to cut this out of your dispensational Bible. You can say with David, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. Amen. And in his law, he meditates day and night. And he will be like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in the season, and its leaf does not wither. And whatever he does, he prospers. But Mm -hmm. the wicked are not so. They are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Exactly. See, we often think as Christians that freedom from the bondage of sin means just freedom from the the, the weight of the law. 
Mm -hmm. That's only half of it. It means now freedom to obey the law. Amen. We were walking in continual obedience. Freedom to love the law. We can sit around and meditate on the law and be like that tree firmly planted. It's an amazing thing because, as you said, we're no longer dead to the law. We're alive to the law. The book of Hebrews says that the Holy Spirit has written the law on our hearts. Right. And now we've got a heart of flesh. It's alive to the law. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing thing. That's why the Apostle Paul says, the problem's not with the law. The problem was with me. The law is good. The law is perfect. But I am sold into slavery, sold under the law. If I could read to you B.B. Warfield. Go ahead. As we're talking about the term redeemer, Christ Mm -hmm. is our redeemer. This is what he says, and I've got before me the works of B.B. Warfield, Volume 2, Biblical Doctrines, page 375, a chapter he's entitled Redeemer and Redemption. This is how it begins. There is... No one of the titles of Christ which is more precious to Christian hearts than Redeemer. There are others, it is true, which are more often on the lips of Christians. The acknowledgement of our submission to Christ as our Lord, the recognition of what we owe to Him as our Savior, these things naturally are most frequently expressed in the names we call Him by. Redeemer, however, is a title of more intimate revelation than either Lord or Savior. It gives expression not merely to our sense that we have received salvation from Him, but also to our appreciation of what it cost Him to procure this salvation for us. It is the name specifically of Christ of the cross. Whenever we pronounce it, The cross is placarded before our eyes and our hearts are filled with loving remembrance, not only that Christ has given us salvation, but that he paid a mighty price for it. It is a name, therefore, which is charged with deep emotion, and it is to be found particularly in the language of devotion. That's good. That is very good. And we're out of time. We'll be back tomorrow night at 6 p.m. For Open Phones Friday, 6 p.m. Open Phones Friday. We'll see you then. Brothers, thanks for joining me again. It's always a pleasure. May God extend His grace to you and peace through our Lord Jesus Christ.